So in the next uh, lesson in this module, which is lesson six, we're going to take a brief look at uh, something a little bit more, um, well, kind of a little more generic, right? We're not going to get into the weeds of all the theory and, uh, and the protocols and whatnot. We're just going to take a look at uh, basic uh, guest access, right? Uh, providing guest access is obviously a very key component to a lot of wireless networks. Um, but providing that guest access can be a bit of a challenge, right? Guests have to be able to easily access the wireless network, but you don't want them to be able to compromise the security of your corporate network. Uh, and then you also have to balance that security with administration of e administrative ease, right? Guests typically have their dynamic, they, they don't, uh, they're not you know, up to speed on the specifics of your organization and so on, all right? So what we're going to do um, going uh, through this lesson is we're going to take a look at the four basic guest flows, uh, the components that are used in those four basic guest flows. Uh, we're going to describe the need, of course, for guest access, which I think you guys kind of already understand. The different authentication methods in a wireless network that we use for guest access. And we're going to define the basic guest access provisioning model uh, that we have in our wireless network. So this is actually probably going to be a little bit more applicable to what you guys are doing in your own environment as well. Uh, and uh, it is going to be, from an administrative perspective, maybe a lot more applicable. All right, Guests have to come in uh, to the network, whether it's a contractor or, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, just a visitor to your organization, they need to have internet access. Typically, um, they might need to have local area network access as well, but they want to check their email, they want to be able to connect to their office and so on. So we understand the need. Uh, traditionally, in wireless networks, we always have a separate SSID, maybe a dedicated VLAN and so on for path isolation. But, uh, and, and traditionally in the past, that's what we've done for guest access. But one size doesn't really fit all, right? It doesn't meet all the requirements, especially if you're dealing with contractors and uh, uh, consultants that come in and they have to have access to specific components of the network. So there might be, it's not just internet access, it's not, not just email access. So we have to have a method to authenticate guests that provides for security, but does not create all this overhead um, that might be associated to that. Now, the best method to secure the network would, of course, be to use 802.1x, but not all devices can perform or utilize or pass the 802.1x protocol, all right? Some devices like printers or cameras, they can only use something called MAB, M-A-B. MAB stands for Mac Authentication Bypass. We'll definitely talk about that in this lesson here. Uh, basically, MAB provides port-based access control using the MAC address of the physical endpoint itself. Uh, or you can use something called WebAuth or Web Authentication. That's used for devices that don't perform 802.1x, but you don't necessarily want to give them uh, you know, MAC Authentication Bypass. It can also be used for guest access, and that's what our primary focus is on in this particular lesson. right? Um, and, uh, uh, or it can be used uh, maybe as a backup solution. Maybe you're onboarding an employee or, you know, the employee is using a BYOD device that doesn't support 802.1x, but they still need to have some level of access for those devices. So we can use web authentication for that. Uh, there are two um, examples of authentication and access. How a guest access uh, how guest access is actually provided uh, and how that's accomplished depends on the infrastructure and, uh, and the method that you use. And we're going to take a look at those components a little bit later on. All right. Employees, usually these guys are going to be using trusted devices. They're going to gain access to the network using 802.1x. They provide their credentials uh, through the extensible authentication protocol. They get authenticated via RADIUS. Uh, etc. And that's usually done through ICE, the Identity Services Engine. The RADIUS server then assigns the VLAN uh, access control lists called DACLs, downloadable ACLs, that it gets uh, uh, deployed for the employees to access the network. 
guests or untrusted devices gain access to the network using web authentication. The guest is redirected to the web portal where credentials get entered. The RADIUS server then assigns the VLAN and the ACLs for the guest to access the internet. Although the guest can access, um, although this guest access can be provisioned for the LAN or the wireless LAN guests, our focus in this course, of course, is for the wireless LAN, right? So three basic areas that have to be defined in order to support web authentication. Where guest path isolation is defined in the network path, where web portal pages are being provisioned, like from the wireless LAN controller, for example, and where users are being provisioned either from the wireless LAN controller or from the RADIUS server. It is what will be answered as far as the components that we use and the technology that we use as we look at the different access methods. And that's what we're going to co uh, cover kind of over the next few slides here. Very, very basic concepts, but it'll give you a general understanding. Local web authentication. That's designed for, say, a small business that needs to provide local guest access. The VLAN that is used is defined in the switch uh, and routed to the internet via a router or firewall at the network edge. Let's say, for example, uh, kind of the most basic concept of this. Uh, we see this a lot. Autonomous access points don't uh, uh, really work in a dynamic environment like what we see with a wireless LAN controller and ICE and all that. So in order to provide wireless guest access, you simply provide an SSID that's open and they authenticate, uh, they connect to the wireless network and, uh, and you restrict their access by assigning them an address, a DHCP address in a particular VLAN and then you specify in your switch and routers how those VLANs can communicate. In the case of uh, Autonomous, I mean, uh, lightweight environments, which is what you see on the diagram here. The wireless LAN controller is what's providing all the services for this local web authentication. It maps an SSID to a dedicated VLAN. That's going to provide path is isolation. Uh, typically, we're still doing open authentication, right? The source of the basic web authentication is a splash page from a web portal, uh, and that's provided by the controller as well. And then we have the creation of local user accounts or guest accounts that includes the SSID that's allowed for that particular account, which then, by the way, the SSID is what ties the user to a particular VLAN and the lifetime of that account, right? How long that they can use that account. Obviously, a very simple provisioning method. Uh, doesn't require the use of ICE, doesn't require the use of extensible authentication, doesn't require the use of 802.1x. The wireless LAN uh, controller actually has a default web login page that can be used for guest authentication. And we can use that page <clears throat> as it is, as it's built, or we can make some modifications. We can hide the Cisco logo, for example. You can create your own headline for the login page. Uh, you can redirect uh, the, the page to a different URL uh, after the login process if you're using HTTP. Uh, or we can download a customized web authentication login page to the actual controller. Uh, that's actually done by creating the web page and then downloading it using TFTP or FTP or SFTP uh, to the wireless controller. Um, the, the reason why a client may choose to do something like that is to have additional elements like uh, uh, applying an acceptable use policy and, and so on. Uh, and that's... You know, if you're using this LWA, that's usually what um, somebody will do, okay? In addition, you have something called a lobby ambassador. Uh, that's a, an account that gets created uh, that, uh, per wireless LAN controller. And, and the purpose of that is to offload guest access provisioning from the IT staff. So this lobby ambassador management account doesn't have access it has access to the controller, but only for the purposes of provisioning guest accounts. Um, it's a management user account, and uh, it has a specific role. We use uh, uh, rule, rules-based access or role-based access of lobby admin, and the whole purpose is to create uh, those accounts. All right. That's going to include a username, a password, 
which is either created or generated, the lifetime, uh, which uh, uh, until the account expires, which is specified in um, days, hours, minutes, or seconds. Uh, lobby admins may also delete accounts or modify it to extend time or reset passwords and so on. All right. Now, one of the situations with deploying local web uh, authentication is that uh, once you're authenticated, and if you look at the diagram here, once you're authenticated um, and um, you know, you've connected to the wireless controller, you follow the traffic path here. Notice that even though we are provisioning the traffic to go to the internet, it is going to pass over the corporate LAN, right? Okay, it's going to pass over the corporate LAN. So the traffic goes through the controller, over the corporate LAN, out to the DMZ. Now, obviously, we're, we're isolating that traffic flow because we're assigning that traffic to a specific VLAN and we have security policies in place to isolate that traffic to, to a specific VLAN. But there is a, a, an additional way to provision this information uh, or to provision this access. Uh, hold on one second. Now this alternate method, um, which uh, is actually the method that we tend to use in, in most guest access environments. Now, it does require an, a secondary controller. Uh, that secondary controller doesn't typically provide all the same functionality, even though it is the same type of controller as your primary controller in the network. But what it does is it ensures that all the traffic that's being sent by your guest users doesn't actually get routed. I mean, it still gets routed on the corporate LAN, but it's actually encapsulated to this anchor controller. So for larger deployments, if we have a DMZ and so on, we can use this anchor. It's called auto anchor mobility. Um, it's also called uh, guest tunneling, by the way, to provide this guest access. It's a feature in mobility, uh, and we're gonna talk about mobility later on in, in, this, in this particular module to restrict a wireless LAN to a single subnet. Doesn't matter where the client's entry point is on the network and so on. Now the way auto anchor operation works is the guest associates to the local controller, the local session gets created, and then on the second step a session tunnel is created to the auto anchor wireless LAN controller and the session is per SSID, it's not per client. So we're not creating multiple sessions every single time a client connects. Packets from the client then get encapsulated and sent through the tunnel to the auto anchor wireless LAN controller. Uh, and then the auto uh, anchor wireless LAN controller is what is the controller that actually de-encapsulates those packets and then delivers them to the wired network. The traffic from the wired network then goes through the same tunnel coming back. This assumes, of course, that you know, your primary goal is gaining access to the internet, all right? And that's, and that's really the key. Effectively, what we're trying to accomplish here is isolating the guest traffic through that tunnel to the auto anchor where wire traffic is routed to the DMZ. So that local wireless LAN controller provides for the tunnels uh, that tunnels the client's traffic to the auto anchor and the uh, anchor wireless LAN controller provides that path isolation. The anchor controller in this case is the source of basic web authentication. It's what provides the splash page for the web portal. That's the controller that you're actually going to create the local user accounts on and so on. Um, you can see the benefit here, but obviously in this particular case, it does require the use of a secondary controller. The nice thing about this process, um, or the nice thing about this, is that you don't have to have a hugely robust secondary controller or anchor controller. You can use like a 2504 or something like that um, to, to, um, to provide this functionality, okay? Another option that you have, and this kind of builds on our previous example, uh, authentication of guests can, can be broken out to a radius server. So it's kind of the same concept. The only thing is we're offloading the actual authentication to Cisco ICE or some other component. The anchor wireless controller is optional, but it doesn't really change. Uh, 
in this case um, as far as the overall process. I mean, the wireless controller, who's talking to ICE will change depending on whether or not you're using an anchor controller or not. The uh, authentication process here, guests associate to the local controller. The local session gets created. The guest receives the web login from that local controller. They enter their creden uh, credentials. That gets forwarded to ICE for authentication. ICE then returns the confirmation, assuming that the credentials are valid. And then guest traffic gets routed to the internet with path isolation provided by the wireless LAN controller. The addition of the anchor controller would help isolate the traffic, but the process really wouldn't change. Um, it, would, it would pretty much be the same. Okay. Another option you have, and remember, these are all options for guest access. You'll see some of these options are also available for corporate access, but what we're really focusing on is, is guest access. Another option for deploying guest access is where we have what we call central web authentication. The local wireless LAN controller is configured to redirect web logins and authentication to ICE. ICE provides the web login pages and the authentication. The guest associates to the local controller. A local session gets created. The guest is redirected to ICE. ICE provides the web portal pages and the guest authentication. Guest traffic then gets routed to the internet. Again, in this particular example, you can add an Anchor Wireless LAN controller to meet those particular needs. So just some examples. Of course, we'll see how to configure this stuff a little bit later on, but I wanted to kind of introduce some of these concepts. So we talked about web authentication and how that can be used uh, for guests and employees. Web authentication can be set up to allow guest access and we can have local web, uh, the, the local controller provide that path isolation, the login pages, etc. We can have an auto anchor wireless LAN controller in the DMZ so we can tunnel the traffic between our primary LAN controller and our, our auto anchor controller. Uh, and we can use ICE to provide external authentication and so on. All right. So that concludes that lesson. Uh, the next thing that we're going to take a look at in lesson seven is uh, what kind of connectivity options do we have in operating systems, native operating systems. Uh, pretty basic uh, discussion as well. So we'll uh, pause on this lesson and we'll move on to the next lesson.